Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. Welcome back from spring break. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm very much looking forward to finishing the semester here at the Ath. And for those of you like me keeping track, that's 35 days until thesis is due. <laughs> My name is Jake Petzold. I'm one of the Athenaeum Woolley Fellows, and I'm pleased to introduce tonight's, tonight's guest. First, though, I must remind you that photography and recording are prohibited during the talk. Tonight, I am particularly enthused to introduce our guest because it's a special privilege to introduce someone whom I'm covering in one of my classes. I should be getting extra credit. <laughs> Elliot Abrams has been a player in American foreign policy for over three decades. Currently, senior fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, he previously served as President George W. Bush's Deputy National Security Advisor for Global Democracy Strategy. In this capacity, he oversaw the White House's Middle East, Democracy, Human Rights, and International Organizations programs. Uh, previously, he was Special Assistant to the President and National Security Council Senior Director in those areas. Before that, Mr. Abrams served on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and was the President of the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C. Mr. Abrams served in the State Department as well for the entirety of the Reagan administration as Assistant Secretary of State, first for International Organization Affairs, then for Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs, and then for Inter-American Affairs. In 1988, he received the Secretary's Distinguished Service Award from Secretary George Shultz. In the 1970s, Mr. Abrams worked for Senators Scoop Jackson and Daniel Patrick Moynihan, as well as the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. He now teaches U.S. foreign policy at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service and serves on the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Council, which directs the activities of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Mr. Abrams' talk is a part of the President's Distinguished Speaker Series and is co-sponsored by the Henry Salvatore Center for the Study of Indiv Individual Freedom in the Modern World, as well as the Athenaeum. And I'm very pleased to see many of our distinguished faculty, as well as President Gann and President and Mrs. Stark here tonight. This is Mr. Abrams' second time at the Athenaeum. The first time he was here was February 1990, and he spoke on the U.S. and Latin America. Tonight he'll be speaking about the Middle East. Please join me in welcoming Elliot Abrams to the Athenaeum. Thank you very much. It, I didn't realize it was um, until Jake told me earlier, <clears throat> been 22 years since I was um, last here, um, which is, of course, too long. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm, I, I have to say that um, certain things happen in life that make you feel young and other things that make you feel old and to be studied in a course, really. <laughs> that one really hit me. Well, let's talk about the um, the Arab Spring, Arab Spring and Arab Winter, and what is happening to democracy in the Middle East. There is a, uh, there's a sour mood now about the, uh, the Arab Spring. Armed gangs in Libya, Salafists, and Muslim brothers win the elections in Egypt. Minorities like the Copts live in fear. Um, the violence of the Assad regime in Syria is condemned by many leaders who then express the fear that after Assad comes chaos, not democracy. The whole, this whole experiment um, with democracy seems to some critics nowadays to be a foolish, idealistic, but foolish project that promises to do nothing but wreak havoc in the Middle East. These same critics cast blame on the Americans who applauded the Arab revolts of the past year, naive, ideological, ignorant, dangerous folk. Well, as one of those folk, I very much appreciate the opportunity today to discuss what's been happening and is likely to happen, and then what, what if anything, the United States might do about it. But let's begin by looking at this phenomenon called the Arab Spring, which is, I think, a series of revolts against oppressive rulers. The failures of the Arab world's rulers were manifest and explicitly described well before the Arab Spring began in 2011. 
It was no secret that these deficiencies <coughs> threatened the ruler's hold on power. Go back to 2002, the Arab Human Development Report from UNDP noted that the spread of democracy in recent decades in Latin America, Eastern Europe, quote, had barely reached the Arab states. It was precisely this lack of freedom, the report argued, that, quote, undermines human development and is one of the most painful manifestations of lagging political development. <clears throat> President George W. Bush recognized this stark reality. He spoke at the 20th anniversary of the National Endowment for Democracy in 2003 and said, are the peoples of the Middle East somehow beyond the reach of liberty? Are millions of men and women and children condemned by history or culture to live in despotism? 60 years of Western nations excusing and accommodating the lack of freedom in the Middle East did nothing to make us safe because in the long run, stability cannot be purchased at the expense of liberty, close quote. Bush's analysis and the UNDP analysis were, I think, right. And those who judged that the old regimes could survive forever were clearly wrong. People wrote in those days about authoritarian resilience or durable authoritarianism. But both of those turned out to be less impressive after all. And the popular hatred of those regimes, much greater. The Arab Spring, I think, therefore, is not a, a kind of peculiarity of history, but a natural outcome for regimes that had quite simply become illegitimate in the eyes of their subjects. Of the possible sources of legitimacy, such as democracy or religion or monarchic succession or the creation of great prosperity, they had none. They were kept in place solely by force, and they were far less stable than the vast majority of scholars and diplomats and political leaders thought. They were not overthrown because George Bush criticized them or because President Obama failed to shore them up, but because they lacked a coherent defense of their own rule. To be more specific about that, it's worth looking at the course of events in Tunisia and Egypt. The United States had always had very, very limited influence or interest, for that matter, in Tunisia, where France was the predominant outside power. We had very few contacts with President Ben Ali. And actually, more than any other country, we protested his human rights abuses, though we did not campaign against them. We were as surprised as the French, or for that matter, as President Ben Ali, when the whole nation suddenly rose up against him in January 2011. I have seen no serious suggestion that we lit that fire. Egypt is different. It has been a source of amazement to me that nearly every Saudi and every Israeli I meet hold the same view when it comes to Egypt. You, you Americans, tossed President Mubarak under a bus, they say. You abandoned your old ally. I am a critic of Obama foreign policy, but that charge is absurd. The administration was slow to respond when Tunisian-style protests uh, spread to Tahrir Square. On January 25th, 2011, Secretary Clinton famously stated that, quote, our assessment is that the Egyptian government is stable. Two weeks later, Mubarak was gone. <laughs> it would be a fair criticism, I think, that the Obama administration did not move quickly enough either to save Mubarak uh, by forcefully counseling him to adjure seeking yet another term in office and promise that his son Gamal would not follow him, or push him out the door. In fact, we did nothing. Or maybe better to say nothing that we did had any impact at all. Events in Egypt responded to internal pressures, not directives from Washington or their absence. But that is the Israeli-Saudi view, which is, by the way, the only thing the Israelis and Saudis seem to agree on other than the need to bomb Iran soon. <laughs> um, but that Israeli-Saudi view is widespread, and I think 
foolish. For what in Egypt or in Tunisia um, or in Libya could have been said by the United States to populations tired of the secret police, censored newspapers, vast corruptions, sham elections, and the, the monarchical leanings in these fake republics. <clears throat> what should we have said? That they should pipe down? That the leader holding power through stolen elections and sheer force should indeed be permitted to install a son or son-in-law or some other repellent relative in power so that the royal family of thieves could remain in power for another generation? So I conclude that the neocons, the Democrats, the others who applauded the Arab uprisings were right. For what was the, what was the alternative? Again, to applaud continuing oppression, to instruct the rulers on better tactics, the way Iran is in fact lecturing and arming Syria's Bashar al-Assad. Such a stance would have made a mockery, of course, of American ideals, would have failed to keep these hated regimes in place for very long and would have left behind a deep, almost ineradicable anti-Americanism. This kind of real politique, so-called real politique, is the path the United States took, for example, after the Greek military coup in 1967. And nearly half a century later now, the Greeks have still not forgiven us for that. Of course, the best answer is we should have been pushing harder for reform all along. But that, that's the kind of Bush neocon democracy activist line. Take uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice's 2005 speech at American University Cairo <clears throat> or Bush's second inaugural address. Both of those speeches were reviled by realists. It would be nice if some critics, some critics, now admitted that those speeches were actually prophetic, even if the United States was far too tentative in adopting, um, as Bush put it at the National Endowment for Democracy, a forward strategy of freedom in the United, excuse me, in the Middle East. Instead, the critics condemn such a strategy for producing the dangers we now see, and I think that's exactly wrong. It was, in fact, the policy of ignoring gross oppression that helped bring us to today's dangers. Bush, after all, was not arguing for instant remedies. He said democracy, democratization, was the work of generations. He was urging reform, in part because it is usually far safer than revolution. Those who thought that durable authoritarianism could persist forever have far more to apologize for than Bush or Rice or the democracy activists do. I just want to pause for a second. What, what do I mean by saying it was, in fact, the policy of ignoring gross oppression that helped bring us to today's dangers? I'll use Egypt as the example again. For years, in fact, for decades, we were nearly silent about repression in Egypt because President Sadat and then President Mubarak gave us many things we wanted. Chief among these in, uh, in the Cold War and after it were the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, a working relationship between Israel and Egypt against Hamas and other Islamic extremist and terrorist groups, and military cooperation with the United States against first the USSR and later in the First and Second Gulf Wars. Mubarak was a welcome visitor to Washington year after year after year. Take a look at the speeches made by president after president after president during those visits and see how much was said to him about repression torture, press censorship, lack of free elections, usually nothing. September 2010, just a few months before Tahrir Square became the center of the revolt, September 2010 is a good example. Mubarak was back in Washington, joining uh, President Obama, the King of Jordan, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel, and Palestinian President Abbas, helping launch a new peace effort, an effort that, by the way, lasted three weeks. 
But the point is Mubarak was once again being seen through the prism of Israeli-Palestinian affairs, not that of Egypt. Egypt, the country, a dictatorship with 85 million people in it, was essentially invisible. It was just Mubarak and his foreign minister. Briefly, in 2005-2006, this changed. The U.S. brought real pressure to bear. This was the high watermark of Bush's freedom agenda and was when Rice gave that really quite impressive speech at American University Cairo. For 60 years, she said, in Cairo, the United States pursued stability at the expense of democracy in the Middle East, and we achieved neither. Let me just give you a few more of her lines. Now we're taking a different course. We're supporting the democratic aspirations of all people. The Egyptian government must put its faith in its own people. The day must come when the rule of law replaces emergency decrees, when the independent judiciary replaces arbitrary justice. The Egyptian government must fulfill the promise it has made to its people and to the entire world by giving its citizens the freedom to choose. She went on in that vein, in Cairo. Mubarak responded to that pressure. Regime critics say this was the period of their greatest access to the press and their least trouble with the secret police. And when I, and I know this from other officials, meet with them or go to Egypt, uh, they thank us for that period, whenever the topic arises. Mubarak, who'd previously never even had an election, he was selected by the sham parliament, changed the constitution to hold elections and to permit people to run against him. This was truly uh, Dr. Johnson's definition of hypocrisy as the tribute vice pays to virtue. But that period ended in 2007, when once again the United States, this is in the Bush administration, chose to forget the real Egypt, that country of 85 million people, the most populous Arab country, and return to that old Arab-Israeli, Israeli-Palestinian prism. This, this case, 2007 and 8, we had the so-called Annapolis process. We thought we needed Mubarak, so we stopped criticizing him, returning to that practice of three decades. In those three decades, Mubarak crushed every liberal or moderate or centrist party or effort to create a party. Typically, when a centrist named Ayman Noor ran against him in 2005, he was jailed for it. When truly moderate Muslims tried to create an alternative to the Brotherhood called the Wasat Party, they were refused the license they needed to do so legally. In 2003, when I was at the NSC, I remember receiving a prominent Egyptian uh, dem democracy activist. And she said to me, I have to tell you I'm not in favor of free elections in Egypt today. She said, I'm in favor of free elections in Egypt 10 years from today. If, she said, we have those 10 years to build and reach out and organize. Now that was in 2003, it's nearly 10 years later now. And they are having free elections in Egypt. And of course, she and others like her did not have those years to organize. Only the Brotherhood was really able to organize in those years. And surely that's one reason they're doing so well. We'll come back to that. But my point here is that America's failure to push harder for greater political space in the Arab countries, not brief interludes of pressure for it, is the culprit. If you're asking what we did wrong or might have done better, Overnight, those political systems in the Arab world have been opened up by the Arab Spring, and only the Islamists are ready for this astonishing new thing called politics. But we are where we are. So the next question is whether the Arab Spring will actually fulfill its promise of greater democratic rights or usher in another era of extremist Islamist regimes or other forms of authoritarianism. And the pessimists may yet be proved right. What I want to do is look at the negative factors, the positive factors, um, see if there's any reason to dispel the gloom and be an optimist. Any comparison of the Arab countries to Eastern Europe suggests that many positive elements of their turn to democracy are missing. The first is the magnet and model 
of the European Union. As one analyst wrote in the Journal of Democracy, Luke and Wei, the single most important factor facilitating the democratization was the strength of ties to the West. While relatively developed countries like the Czech Republic would likely have democratized, even absent the European Union, the EU played a central role in other parts of Europe, such as Albania, Romania, Serbia, where domestic conditions were unfavorable to democratic development. Indeed, with the possible exception of Mongolia, the only stable democracies that emerged after 1989 were those that were offered full membership in the European Union, close quote. Well, by contrast, the Arab countries have neither a good model of Arab democracy nor the inducement of membership in a rich and prestigious club like the EU. The external environment is not conducive to democratization, and that's the first reason to be a pessimist about the Arab Spring. Second, the repressive regimes in Eastern Europe were imposed from outside, from Russia. The repressive Arab regimes survived by their own wits and devices, which means also that more remnants of those regimes survive today. The security establishments have not disappeared. Third, unlike Central and Eastern Europe, there's no prior experience with democracy. If democracy, if democracy is what creates citizens, the Arabs do not have any experience of citizenship. Citizenship with rights and responsibilities, with a, a special relationship between the individual, the state, and the society. No experience with it. Fourth, the economic situation in the region suggests trouble in several ways. The Arab countries, maybe with the exception of Tunisia, have not achieved that, that level of um, prosperity and size of the middle class that sociologists and political scientists have for so long said is necessary to maintain democracy, or is at least correlated with democracy. Uh, recently, the, you may have seen the World Bank study of China 2030 about China's trajectory. There was an interesting couple of sentences in it. The rising ranks of the middle class, the World Bank said, and higher educational levels will inevitably increase demand for better social governance, governance and better opportunities for participation in public policy debate. That was the World Bank. Even Vladimir Putin has kind of acknowledged this point in a bizarre op-ed in the Washington Post. He wrote, people are becoming more affluent, educated, and demanding. The results are new demands on the government and the advance of the middle class above the narrow objective of guaranteeing their own prosperity. We'll put, his, put that in the same his, hypocrisy box. Um, well, but that's basically right as a, as a point. And it is promising for the future, say, of democracy in China. But it is a reminder of the absence of such material conditions in the Arab world, most of the Arab world. There are no rising ranks of the middle class in a place like Egypt or Libya or Tunisia. And there is no steady jump in educational levels. Staying with economics, there's also the problem of oil. For political scientists have long noted that when the source of national wealth is one extraction industry under government control, the likely product is an authoritarian regime, not pluralism. Terry Carl of Stanford, who was one of the first people to write about this, called it the resource curse and said, the resource curse means that petrostates are even less subject to the types of internal countervailing pressures that help to produce bureaucratically efficacious, authoritative, liberal, and ultimately democratic states elsewhere, precisely because they are relieved of the burden of having to tax their own subjects." Close quote. Uh, Luke and Wei reminded us of the effect of the economic trajectory in Russia, and that's another reason to be a bit pessimistic. In the early 1990s, he wrote, public opinion throughout, throughout the former Soviet Union was seized by hatred of communism, which citizens associated with empty shelves, shoddy products, and geriatric leaders. A few years of economic collapse and hyperinflation changed all that, turning the communist era into something remembered much more fondly as a time of stable expectations, guaranteed benefits, and global power. 
In countries such as Tunisia and Egypt, it is almost inevitable, he wrote, that within a few years, if not sooner, the old regime will look a lot better to a lot of people. There is scant reason to think that the new leaders will have an easier time solving the problems of corruption, inflation, and unemployment that helped spark the revolts of the last year. Those are four reasons for being pessimistic, but thus far I have not really listed that we are speaking about Arab states. Let's make that the fifth reason for pessimism. I think there are the examples of, of Indonesia, Malaysia, and they're not alone, suggest that Islam is no barrier to democratization. Um, just this month, we saw a very poor Muslim nation, Senegal, hold free elections in which the incumbent president, President Wad, could not win in the first round, and he will now, I would say, almost certainly lose in the second round, March 25th, and be thrown out. But what of Arab culture? Does not the lack until this year in Tunisia, maybe, anyway, does not the lack of any working Arab democracy suggest a problem? It does. And I point to some failings that I think are the source of real concern. The first is the treatment of women, who are, after all, half the electorate and half the human resources available to make democracy work. It isn't coincidence that the state with the generally regarded as having the best chance of consolidating democracy is the one where women have achieved the greatest equality, again, Tunisia. Treatment of women, point A. Point B, the other big Arab failing is a widespread belief in conspiracy theories, views that suggest that the future is controlled by dark forces, Shia, Jews, Americans, outsiders. The curse of these theories is that they undermine the desire or insistence on controlling one's own fate through democracy, civic action, industrious self-help. How do you mobilize a polity, or at least mobilize it for any positive program, if that polity is permeated with the belief that hidden forces control the future anyway? All right. That's the case for gloom and doom. Uh, it's a powerful case, I think, but it is not uncontradicted. There are some reasons for optimism. The first is that there is no real legitimate global model today other than democracy, a category in which I am including constitutional monarchy. The alternatives to democracy, theocracy, communism, seem defunct. No one has put this better than Andrew Nathan, the China scholar at Columbia, in an article he called Authoritarian Impermanence. Let me quote him. Like all contemporary non-democratic systems, the Chinese system suffers from a birth defect that it cannot cure. The fact that an alternative form of government is, by common consent, more legitimate. Even though the regime claims to be a Chinese form of democracy on the grounds that it serves the people and rules in their interest, and even though a majority of Chinese system, citizens today accept that claim, the regime admits, and everyone knows, that its authority has never been subject to popular review and is never intended to be. In that sense, the regime is branded as an expedient, something temporary and transitional, needed to meet the exigencies of the time. Democratic regimes, by contrast, often elicit disappointment and frustration, but they confront no rival form that outshines them in prestige. Authoritarian regimes, in this sense, are not forever. For all their diversity and longevity, they live under the shadow of the future, vulnerable to existential challenges that mature democratic systems do not face. I agree with that view. I think that's right, and I think it will affect the political path of Arab states as well. The Arabs want progress. They want to be modern, and they understand that the lack of democracy is a form of backwardness. Professor Gregory Gauze of the uh, University of Vermont, has, who is a leading analyst of, of uh, Arab politics, put it this way. The demands for greater political voice are not going to go away. Even the richest oil exporters will have to face them. The push for democracy will run up against the 
privileged position of entrenched elites in both oil and non-oil states, military elites, minorities with disproportionate power, ruling families, but those holding power will not be able to make arguments against democratic reform that will be taken seriously by their publics. The idea that there will be a credible anti-democratic argument based on Islam, or culture, or the hereditary principle to legitimate an Arab regime is fading fast. So that's the first reason for optimism. The second is the very spread of democracy to so many cultures around the world. Uh, it's been a long time since we actually believed that democracy was exclusively a North Atlantic phenomenon. President Bush in his that 2003 uh, speech made fun of this. He talked about the cultural condescension. After the Japanese surrender in 1945, a so-called Japan expert asserted that democracy in the former empire would, quote, never work. Prospects for democracy in post-Hitler Germany, experts said, were most uncertain at best, a claim made in 1957. Um, we've heard this. I remember hearing it with respect to Latin America uh, when I was working on that in the 80s. People said to me, you don't understand Catholic culture. People accept the rule of the pope in religion, and therefore they will accept and do accept authoritarian structures in politics. The church is a permanent bulwark against democracy. This is arguments made quite seriously. What was said about Japan, German culture, then about Catholicism, uh, then Islam, does not appear, I think, very persuasive today. Democracy has been achieved, troubled, challenged, interrupted, but achieved in so many different countries and cultures that it seems hard to argue that every single Arab country, so varied in social, economic, and political structures, will find it impossible. The third reason for optimism is that one of the former obstacles to democracy, the opposition to it from Islamists, seems to be dissipating. Not only the Muslim Brotherhood affiliates, but even the Salafists are moving in this direction. Jonathan Brown wrote, uh, of the Carnegie Endowment, wrote a, about this, saying that they believe, the Salafists, the only valid system of rule for Muslims is based on Sharia law. As a result, the most prominent Salafi scholars of the modern period have forbidden involvement in democratic politics, including voting. The decision of the Egyptian Salafis to form political parties and enter electoral politics thus marks a significant departure from the typical Salafi position. Salafi scholars, many now turned politicians, have begun treading the same path as the Muslim Brotherhood. Salafi parties began stressing the practical nature of politics, stating that now is not the time for ideology. They're beginning to have a real stake in the democratic process. Now, I don't know if everyone here finds that reassuring. For people holding the views of most Americans want to see Islamists supporting democracy but not winning elections. But even after watching the returns in Tunisia and Egypt, it may be at least a slight reassurance. Um, and this is a fourth reason for optimism, that Islamists do not have a history of winning, particularly not after the first election. The pattern. The pattern should not be that surprising. As Olivier Roy put it, the Islamists start out strong because they are, quote, rooted in society and decades of opposition against authoritarian regimes gave them experience, legitimacy, and respect, close quote. But a study of 21 Islamic countries recently found that Islamist parties fare more poorly than popularly believed, and they gain their highest vote total in the first election. This study described a common political arc for Islamist parties. As Wa said, they emerged from oppression, the oppression of the previous regime, with a reputation for honesty and courage, and they attract many voters who are not zealots. And then they fail to produce tangible results, when, to put it more starkly, Islam turns out not to be the answer, and many voters turn elsewhere. As the authors summarize, when Muslims are given the opportunity to vote freely for Islamic parties, they have tended not to do so. There are plenty of caveats. Islamist parties do somewhat better in Arab countries than non-Arab countries. 
And of course, you have to have a second and third election for there to be an arc. But time is also part of the antidote to extremism. Bush, in that National Endowment for Democracy speech, said, the daily work of democracy itself is the path of progress. It teaches cooperation, the free exchange of ideas, and the peaceful resolution of disputes. Can the Islamic parties learn to play along? Those two scholars I have been citing on the 21 countries, Kurzman and Nahvi, say yes. The Islamic party's overall trend toward publicly embracing global norms of democracy and human rights is significant. The experience of political participation, both in government and in civil society, has changed their outlooks in ways that they did not imagine when they started down the path of electoral politics. As Olivier Wass said, they're becoming more middle class bourgeois. They benefited from the liberalization of local economies, particularly in the non-oil countries. They have been elected with a clear agenda, stability, good government, good governance, and a better economy. It's a combination, he put it, of technocratic modernism and conservative values. That is their brand. And to turn their back on multipartism and legalism would alienate a large portion of their constituency at a time when they have no means to confiscate power. They have neither military forces nor oil wealth to bypass the people. They have to negotiate and deliver, close quote. Now, I'm as dubious about the Salafis as anyone here, I think, but their acceptance of democracy is nevertheless a significant change. Uh, Gregory Gauss summed it up. This is a major change in the Salafi movement, which in the past was vehemently anti-democratic. Whether this change is purely tactical remains to be seen. But the general movement among Islamists of all ideological stripes toward democratic politics undercuts the one serious alternative to democracy as the basis for regime leg legitimacy in the Arab world. That's third. The fourth reason for optimism is the absence anywhere in the Arab world, so far at least, of any charismatic anti-democratic leader equivalent to the Ayatollah Khomeini in the 1970s. We can we can rightly worry that there are no Havels and Mandelas and Valences. But the positive side of that coin is the equal absence of Khomeini's and Hitler's and Perón's. That's the fourth reason for optimism. The fifth concerns the monarchies. This may seem counterintuitive, but it shouldn't be. The, the fake republics that have fallen or are falling, Syria, entirely lacked legitimacy. The monarchies have some. In several cases, they have a good deal. The exception may be Bahrain, simply because the royal family is Sunni while the population is Shia. But even there, I'd say the quantum of legitimacy is not zero. It's striking. The monarchies have emerged pretty well so far from the storms affecting the Arab world. Ludger Kunhar of Bonn University addressed this issue rather well. He said, how can one explain the almost paradoxical phenomenon that hereditary monarchies seem to be less affected by the protest against personal rule and authoritarianism that has resonated across the Arab world? One initial observation is undeniable, he said. Saudi Arabia is particularly interested in supporting Arab monarchies and is doing so with an enormous amount of money. But the vested interests of the Saudi family alone do not explain why Arab monarchies tend to be more resilient to the current wave of protest heard all over the Arab world. One has, to, one has to go beyond the obvious and look for structural explanations. Most evident is that power based on traditional legitimacy continues to play a stabilizing role in the transformation of societies and their political systems. Usually Republican authoritarian personal rule, Ben Ali, Mubarak, Assad, is built on a political ideology and can only be maintained through a security apparatus and the pressure it can exert on rising popular demand for change. In contrast, he goes on, traditional hereditary rule seems to be able to maintain power with more respect, possibly even with acquired legitimacy and with lesser need 
for the exercise of violence against its own citizens. Now, the history of Europe shows, of course, some monarchies survive and some monarchies don't. What must the Arab monarchs do beyond throwing money around to survive? Professor Cunard suggests a few good lessons. Avoid war, for one. Disconnect the royal court from the security apparatus so the king becomes a symbol of national unity rather than a symbol of oppression. Allow space for elected institutions to develop and grow in power, stepping back from the daily business of politics, maintaining symbolic and traditional authority precisely by ceding power under a constitutional system, and differentiate between your own wealth, the wealth of the royal family, and the wealth of the country. Put it another way, you're just the king. You don't own the whole country. Something, something that would come as a shock to the Saudi royal family today. So we've looked at the reasons for thinking the Arab Spring has little chance of producing transitions to democracy and the reasons for greater optimism. Let me ask another question now, the last one. What can we do about it? What should we do about it, we the United States? Think about the NGO saga in Egypt, which began on December 29th when some democracy workers and NGOs were um, detained. We all watched this. They were prevented from, for two months from leaving the country. Seven of them hid out in the US embassy compound in Cairo in order to avoid arrest. I know that compound pretty well. It, it has a big office building and the ambassador is very nice residence, but I would not want to spend two months hanging around there waiting to see if you were gonna be arrested. What should we do? Is this kind of democracy programming the kind that was that got them arrested in Egypt. Is that the answer? I want to recount a conversation I had with an Egyptian friend earlier this year when I bemoaned the fate of those NGO staffers who were in detention in the, in the embassy. And I attacked the Egyptian officials who put them there. And he said, yes, the officials, entirely bad. But he said, oh, well, I hope they close those NGOs down. And I said, what? You hope they close the NGOs down? He said, yes, it would be the best thing that ever happened for the chances of liberal democracy in Egypt. More surprise on my part. Some real, some to draw him out. And I said, what are you talking about? And here's how he answered. One, what those organizations have done is the following. One, they have removed a whole generation from politics to NGOs. Instead of doing actual political work in political parties, the easier route was the NGOs. Everyone established an NGO because that was where the money and the travel were. Two, this is my friend going on. A whole gener I was taking notes by this time. A whole generation was corrupted. Let me give you an example, he said to me. The US government paid an Egyptian NGO $600,000 to monitor the Shura Council. That's the kind of upper house. Shura Council elections a couple of years ago under Mubarak. Now, why anyone in his right mind would care about those elections, he said, is beyond me. But anyway, what usually happens is that the NGOs do the work while putting a very high price tag on it. So they finance themselves that way. Three, the Egyptian NGOs, due to the funding demands, have been forced to work on what donors think is the cool idea in town. First, it was election observation. Then it became video activism. The real needs of Egyptian democracy have hardly been of interest to anyone. Four, he said, they nurtured a leftist activism that hides itself in the disguise of human rights. Many of the people they're actually training and funding are not liberals. They're leftists of all stripes and Arab nationalists and Trotskyites and anarchists and the like. And fifth, he said, this created a culture of dependency. None of those Egyptian NGOs even try to find local funding or look for a sustainable work model. Of course, some foreign funding is needed, but he said, I'd rather have an interested US individual or NGO fund an Egyptian NGO that they believe in rather than have the US government do it. There's no limitation to how a bureaucracy can ruin a good idea, he said. 
Very interesting. Now, maybe he goes too far, but he does make some strong points about the problems inherent in our programs. So what should we do, I think, first, top to bottom, new look at all our democracy assistance programming in Arab lands? What are their goals? What's the real impact? Whom are they reaching? What, if anything, is their distortive effect? Looks as if often they only reach a small elite, secular, well-educated, English-speaking group in the capital. And that may actually help us understand why those groups keep getting beaten by Islamist parties, for example, just now in Morocco and Tunisia and Egypt. For another thing, those programs are most often run by NGO and US government employees and consultants. Maybe they're beltway bandits, so-called. Maybe they're great idealists. But one thing they're not, experienced politicians. Why should we expect that they would understand and be able to teach how to win an election? They've never done it. Our programming is useful as a symbol of our principles, but it may be, and it may be the best substitute, best substitute for politics in countries where politics is forbidden. But whether we're teaching anything useful about politics, once politics breaks out after the Arab Spring, that seems dubious to me. The most useful thing I think we can do is getting people access to information and the ability to share information. We used to know how to do this. Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, we seem to be forgetting uh, the Voice of America, the quality of our Arabic language broadcasting in The Voice and some of the other networks um, is not, I think, very good. Listeners have been complaining for years that many of the reporters we use idolize, idealize, copy CNN and Al Jazeera and present news that attacks the policies of the United States in the region. We ought to be providing channels that present alternatives to conventional views, not ones that echo them. We ought to be directing far more money to getting people internet access. It's the modern equivalent of what RFERL were doing of shipping Lech Valenza fax machines decades ago. Uh, we're doing it, we're doing it, but we're not doing enough and we're not doing it fast enough. So I'm dubious about whether the, the answer to the question, what should we do, is more democracy assistance programming. But even more important than the programs we do or don't do are the ideas we defend. Let me go back to my Egyptian friend. He said, the goal should not be to give people the tools above all, but to expose them to the content. <clears throat> to cite an example, he said, USAID funds a million dollar program in Egypt whose goal is to give Egyptian newspapers new computers. He said, uh, <laughs> in their assessment of this program, AID people went back and found the computers were still in boxes. Well, my friend said, who cares? I don't care if the journalist in Al-Aram writes the same kind of anti-American articles that he writes on a new computer instead of his old computer. I care about changing the content of what he writes. At the heart of the crisis is the fact that the West does not believe in its very ideals anymore. I cannot expect an American NGO official to spread the ideal of Western civilization in Egypt if he himself does not proudly hail them. Now that touches on a larger, deeper problem that's not the topic today. But too often our help is mechanistic. Let's provide computers. Let's teach election monitoring. Without the intellectual content, you need to have to promote democracy. Um, it's interesting to me, when I said before that when I run into lots of Egyptians, they say that 2005 and 2006 was the period when the regime backed off gave them a little more political space, and they thank American officials for that. They, know, they, they don't thank us for programming. They don't say, thank you for the NGO programming of 2005 and 6. This may provide the most important answer to the question, what should we do? What should we do more of? That is, our greatest contribution is not the money we spend on NGO programs, but our overall policy stance, our pressure for respect for human rights, our criticism of human rights violations, our demands for more political space, our willingness to tie 
relations with the United States, including aid levels, to their performance. I've been a supporter of the National Endowment for Democracy since the day it was founded, 30, a little more than, well, 30 years ago, just under. But I don't think that work will be central to the advance of democracy in the Arab world. It's too easy to appropriate a few million bucks and send some idealistic young Americans off to Cairo and Tunis and Tripoli and Damascus. Far more important is the real policy of the United States. Whether we repeatedly state our support for democracy and human rights and condemn violations and press for change, and again, tie relations to the US in part to this subject. We had all those NGO workers in Cairo in September 2010 when we were celebrating Hosni Mubarak in Washington. It doesn't work. And the point I'm making that we must defend America's ideas about human rights can be disputed. Olivier Roy, whom I quoted before, disagrees. He said, he said, the issue is institutionalizing democracy, not promoting liberal policies. Democracy could take hold only if it is based in well-established values. Liberalism does not precede democracy, he said. America's founding fathers were not liberal, but once democracy is rooted in institutions and political culture, then, then the debate on freedom, censorship, social norms, and individual rights could be managed through freedom of expression and changes of majorities in parliament, close quote. Well, I understand that point. Um, Governor Morris was the American ambassador of France in 1789, and he wrote back in that year of the French, quote, they want an American constitution without realizing they have no Americans to uphold it. Olivier Roy is saying that democracy creates citizens who may then later adopt liberalism as the policy of the land. But is that right? I cannot see an American policy of supporting free elections and efficient government institutions that produce governments that persecute Christians and other minorities and prevent uh, freedom of the press. For as Americans, we believe, I can put it this way, in both the Constitution and the Declaration. To take an example, Olivier Roy is right if he means that we should be more concerned about institutional democratic development today than whether there is a law forbidding insulting the prophet or in monarchies, insulting the king. That will come later. It came later here. It came later in Europe. How few decades ago was it that you could go to jail for insulting the Queen of England? But what is the democracy he's defending if it is merely a series of institutional arrangements and does not teach about liberty under law? What is the political culture he supports if it has no ideological content beyond majority rule? Shall we call it progress if, in addition to barring insults of the prophet, they bar any citizen from changing his religion away from Islam, or bar the construction of churches, or bar women from running for president, or insist they wear the burqa? Where I think Olivier Roy is wrong is in suggesting that democracy is merely instrumental, with content to be supplied later when democracy is consolidated. I think we must press for both developments at once, form, if you will, and content, lest we promote in Arab lands a form of majoritarian democracy that suppresses dissent and nonconformist beliefs in the name now, not of some dictator, but of a true majority of the citizens, of the general will, you might say. To teach citizenship surely means more than teaching that states should avoid authoritarian rule by generals or kings or despots. America's founding fathers may not have been liberals by today's standards when it came to social mores, but surely they count as liberal when we recall that the Constitution not only has Articles 1, 2, and 3 about the branches of the government, but also the first 10 amendments adopted simultaneously and indeed as a condition of the ratification of the Constitution. The main thing we should do then is, I think, say what we believe in, say it often, and make sure our policy reflects our words. Hypocrisy 
is not an effective foreign policy, nor is it a good way to promote democracy. Just when democracy is vanquishing every alternative form of political legitimacy, we should not be shy about supporting it, nor should we be shy about promoting the values that Roy called liberalism. So I'm, in the end, I'm a, uh, a short-term pessimist and a longer-term optimist about the Arab Spring, stripping away long-standing and deeply rooted authoritarian systems is a long, dangerous, frequently violent process. And we may see the Russian experience repeated. Democracy becomes equated with chaos. Vladimir Putin emerges. As we see now in Russia, though, with the surprisingly poor showing of his party in the parliamentary elections and the mass protests in Moscow, Putin, too, may not last forever. The new governments of the Middle East will need to win the loyalties of populations that seek more dignity, more freedom from oppression, and better lives. And there, there are years of danger ahead, and there will surely be very uneven patterns of democratization. That's been the case, after all, in Africa, and Latin America, even in Europe. But the, the sour analysis that the Arab revolts will lead only inevitably, permanently, to disaster is based I would say neither in scholarship nor in experience. So batten down the hatches for the years, maybe the decades to come. Reward progress, criticize oppression, express solidarity with allies who are trying to reform, but do not fall into a cynical and hopeless view. Do not abandon our support in the Arab lands as elsewhere for the one political system that gives promise of freedom and real citizenship. The Arab Spring may well be followed by the Arab winter. But after winter, there's always the chance that spring will find a way to return the following year. Thank you. Thank you. We will now be taking questions. As usual, preference will be given to students and faculty. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'd like to talk about, uh, just ask you about Syria. Yes. Um, you're a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist in the Arab Spring. Um, is it the same for, uh, for the situation in Syria? Because it looks like most, uh, most nations concerned seem to be throwing their hands up in exasperation or despair. One has to be a short-term <clears throat> pessimist because there is massive amounts of violence now in Syria, and no one is doing anything about it except Iran and Russia, um, which are giving uh, arms and training to Assad's forces. Um, in my view, this is a wonderful case, not so common, where our ideals and our strategic interests merge. It's a vicious, murderous, horrible regime. Um, and it's an enemy of the United States. And it's Iran's only Arab ally. And Hezbollah's armorer and defender. Um, so everybody is better off if that regime falls. Um, it seems to me the main question now is whether we uh, hope for its fall or do something. Because the people who are sustaining the regime are doing plenty. They're murdering peaceful demonstrators by the day. And in the case of Russia and Iran, giving them the, the regime the wherewithal to survive. I think we need to do more than uh, supply the opposition with speeches, which is what we've been doing so far. I believe the United States is on the verge of giving non-lethal aid. I think that'll happen in the next couple of weeks. That means uh, radios, uniforms, boots, as um, someone quipped to me recently. We don't want, we don't mind having American boots on the ground in Syria as long as there are no Americans in them. So we'll give them, we'll, th this is important, political support, moral support, it's not enough. It's not enough for them to have radios so that they can slightly more efficiently evade being killed by the army. My own view is that we should be arming the opposition. Uh, and I think actually if, if, as the months go by, we'll get to that. I think this stage one is the non-lethal aid and stage two is the lethal aid. I'm not yet fully persuaded by the McCain-Lieberman-Graham view that we should um, conduct airstrikes, because I'm not sure that I understand what a good target selection would be. 
On the other hand, Senator McCain knows a lot of it more about this kind of stuff than I do. So I say that without um, being certain. I can't, of course, be that, that I'm right. But I, I do think that it is an awful thing for us and our European allies to be watching now for a year the slaughter of peaceful protesters. And if the argument is, well, you know, the opposition, you've got Al Qaeda and so forth there, we have created or allowed the creation of a vacuum. Of course they're going to jump into that vacuum. The best way to make sure that their strength does not grow is to bring down that regime um, as soon as we possibly can. It would be much better, the Syrian people, I think, will be much better off for it. And apparently, so do they think that. Thank you for coming to the app. Uh, how do you think Egypt and Syria's changing government will affect each country's respective relationship with Israel? Syria's and? In the case of Syria, if we <clears throat> um, assume that, they, that the regime will fall over the next year, um, I think there's a, a <laughs> kind of nightmare scenario for the Israelis. And it is not war. Because a new regime in Syria is not going to go to war with Israel. That's nuts. The Israeli nightmare, I think, has to be democracy. What happens if, admittedly, the odds are against it. What happens if you have a wonderful democratic regime in Damascus, and the new cabinet consists of a Valencia type and a Havel type, and oh, God, a Mandela type. It's fabulous. And this new government says to us and others in the West, we need to consolidate our hold on the Syrian people's support for democracy, and the way to do that is we need to have the Golan back. That's, I think, the Israeli nightmare. Uh, most Israelis think that that's a, not a nightmare you have to worry about because Havel is nowhere to be seen uh, around Damascus. But I think the new government there would continue essentially the same relationship, with one important exception, but essentially in that the Syrian-Israeli border is a quiet border for decades. They are not... Uh, engaging in, in uh, warfare or terrorism uh, against each other. Um, the relationship would be sour. It would be cold. There would be the demand for the Golan back. But I think a new government in Syria would be, would be uh, in such difficulty that it would be likely to just sort of put Israel to the side. They have bigger troubles. Egypt. I think we can see the outlines of what is happening and is, and is I think, going to stay in place. Um, running a country is a hard thing to do. Feeding 88 million people is a really hard thing to do. And the Muslim Brotherhood volunteered for the job, and they've got the job. And now they have a real problem, which is war with Israel doesn't help. Hostilities with Israel, trouble, trouble along the border, violence in the south of Sinai, all that does is mean that people don't come as tourists. So the Brotherhood is having to clamp its teeth and not talk much about this problem of Israel. And they've already said they're not going to fool around with the Egyptian-Israel peace treaty in any significant way. Um, so I think you know, we, we, one of the reasons I disagree so much with my Ismaili, Israeli friends who regret the departure of Mubarak is that Mubarak's 30 years were a time of vast government-promoted anti-Semitism in Egypt and a very cold peace. You may recall that in 30 years as president of Egypt, the only time Mubarak set foot in Israel was for Rabin's funeral. Really cold peace. I think that will continue. Um, some of the symbolic warmth that we have seen, like a meeting between the president of Egypt and the prime minister of Israel, um, will dissipate. There'll be less of that. Um, but I think in, uh, the one thing that the Israelis worry about is actually not a problem created by the government in Cairo, but one that is a problem for it. Uh, loss of control of Sinai. There, are, um, there is now a real problem of crime and even terrorism in the Sinai because it's a gigantic area that has never been very well policed. And relations between the government in Cairo and the Bedouin tribes who live in the Sinai have always been poor and remain poor. But that's a kind of shared worry between the Israelis and uh, Egyptians. Hi, 
Hi, thank you very much for coming. Well, we're all very Welcome. thankful, but uh, I want to talk more about the idea of arming the Syrian rebels. Now, you mentioned before that it would just be to counterbalance Russia's arming of Assad. Right. Uh, my question is, you mentioned before that Russia would not be able to respond militarily, but how would it respond diplomatically to a U.S. attempt to arm the rebels? The reference to before is a conversation we had earlier this, uh, this afternoon. Um, first, I think the the reason for arming the Syrian rebels is not just that Russia and Iran are arming the Syrian army, but that they appear to be fighting for freedom uh, against a horrible, anti-American, viciously murderous regime. That's reason enough. Um, the reference to the Russian military response was that I had said in an earlier meeting with students, <clears throat> what would the Russians do if we began to arm the Syrian uh, opposition. Well, somebody is probably doing it already, um, probably some of the Gulf Arabs, and they'll probably do more of it. Uh, I don't think the Russians have responded to that much. If we do this, it will be covert. We won't announce it. And if the Russians ask us about it, we'll say, what? <laughs> so there'll be no you know, dialogue about this. Um, and I don't think they're in a position to do much militarily. The only thing they can do is what they're already doing. They can send planes with arms to Damascus. Um, they are not a global power, not really. They are not going to put you know, uh, aircraft carrier task forces off the coast of, um, of Syria. They don't, they don't want to fight. They want a cheap victory. And so far, they're, they're getting one. Um, diplomatically. Uh, they'll, they'll do what they're doing. I mean, we're not arming the one side, but they already are arming the other side. In the UN, what have they done? They've prevented condemnations in the Security Council. They've defended Assad. And you get these occasional statements about um, the violence must be brought to an end. But they are defending Assad in the Security Council, which is why it won't be possible to get what we had in Libya, which is a Security Council um, authorized activity. If there is any military activity in Syria, which I doubt there will be, um, it would have to be more like what President Clinton did in the Balkans, that is NATO authorized rather than uh, UN authorized. But I don't, I think the Russians will be, will make um, mean speeches. I don't think it will go beyond that. Thank you very much for coming. Um, you, you said that one of the things that really undermines our spreading of democratic and liberal ideas, especially in the Middle East but around the world, has to do with our, our hypocrisy in speech and our inability to sort of make the case forthrightly and consistently. I want to ask you about a couple of, of, sp a couple of tough cases and see what you think about them, one very specific, one very general. Uh, the specific one is Bahrain. Mm. And the general one is our general backing away from a lot of those principles that are enshrined in those 10 amendments to the Constitution you mentioned, where we cite reasons of state for things like a Patriot Act for Guantanamo and so on and so forth. Do those undermine us? Or is it the case that, as Edward Cook said, reasons of state lay Magna Carta? Well, as to the, um, <clears throat> as to the second, then I'll come to Bahrain. Um, I think something like the, the Arab take on, the Arab impression of Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib does much more harm. I mean, any Arab who's been to this country knows that it's a free country and people do not you know, go around all day cowering for fear of, of the state. Um, but they have a view of what happened at Abu Ghraib, that it was not a bunch of uh, particularly evil or sick um, or criminal soldiers, but that's the way it is. That's the way they, the army was treating Arabs. Likewise, Guantanamo, where I think they're way, way off, where I, I think uh, Guantanamo is a far better place to be incarcerated than most state prisons in the United States, which is, of course, not a great thing anyway, because most state prisons are, are really awful. But it's a hell of a lot better than, than the prisons anybody's in in any Arab country also. 
But that's not their impression. Their impression is it's a hellhole where torture takes place. And I think that matters a lot more in their impression of us uh, than the domestic uh, side of it, which I think, you know, um, we, have to make, we have to make decisions as citizens what we want to do. How far do we need to go to protect ourselves? What does the Constitution require? Uh, but the finer points of that, I think, are, are lost in their debate. Um, Bahrain. Bahrain is a, is a source of real, it's almost despondency for me. It's a place I like very much and see <clears throat> going down the drain. Um, I think we have made a mistake uh, from the very beginning when these Arab Spring motivated riots began. I think we should have jumped in in a big way. Uh, I blame the Obama administration for not doing so. To say to the king and the royal family, um, you have got to have a negotiation here. You're going to have a constitutional monarchy or you're going to live in Zurich. That's what's going to happen. And it's not going to take very long for it to happen. I still think that's true. And we didn't do it. I, I think it is partly um, the president had no relationship with the king. The king is a weak actor. Uh, compared with the others in the royal family in the system, many of whom are very tough, competent, really uh, repressive officials. And the counterbalance has to be the king saying, no, we're going to make a deal. And he has the authority to do it because he's king, but he doesn't have the guts to do it. And he hasn't done it. And I think we could have helped him find the guts, we and the British. Uh, and we stood back and said, well, we don't want to impose. And I think that was a big mistake because what we would have been imposing would have been peace, negotiations, compromise, a path to democracy. Um, it's not impossible now, but um, I thought you were going to say the Saudis. Um, it, well, yes and no. It's, you know, Saudi Arabia is a much closer ally and a much worse country. Um, I'm not suggesting that what we need to do is get up and, and say, you know, we've just read the amnesty report on Saudi Arabia and we're breaking relations. But I do think we have a responsibility to speak more candidly about what we don't like in Saudi Arabia. Um, not because it's going to move them. I've had these conversations with Saudi officials. You know, Saudi Arabia is the only country in the Gulf, the only country in the Arabian Peninsula that doesn't permit churches. The others, Kuwait, Bahrain, UAE, Oman, they have churches. And I've had this argument with Saudi officials. You're supposed to love religion, love God. You're in favor of religion including for people who are not Muslims. And you are denying people the right to practice their religion. How can that possibly be something you believe in? Um, that conversation took place in January 2001, and you can see it's had a large impact. Um, uh, treatment of women, obviously, uh, is, from our point of view, abhorrent. Um, I don't think we say enough about it. I always go back to, you know, Reagan and the Soviets. He was negotiating constantly with the Soviet leadership while he said it's an evil empire and it'll end up in the dustbin of history. And I think we could say, I think we could speak more frankly about where we see some of these countries um, going off the deep end. In the case of Saudi Arabia, they have so much money that they aren't going to listen very well. In the case of Bahrain, I think there were there was about a month or so when we, we could perhaps have made a difference. I still think we can make a difference, but we're, um, I think we're insufficiently active. Thank you for your talk. Um, you discussed the reasons for pessimism and optimism for the emergence of democracy in places like Tunisia and Egypt. And I was wondering if the reasons to be pessimistic or optimistic about the um, the I guess, potential for reform in places like Jordan and Oman are at all distinct? 
Well, as, as I said, the, the monarchies um, are different. Um, this is, you know, each happy monarchy is different in its own way. Uh, the problem, Oman is different in part because um, uh, they're going to have a big problem when the sultan dies. I mean, he's been in power for something like 45 years. Um, he has no children. So it's not, it is not at all clear who um, will succeed him. And that could be a moment of real instability. Um, but it's not a particularly repressive place. And I think there is a chance for uh, constitutional monarchy to develop there. Um, Jordan, uh, I think that the, the king, King Abdullah, um, has followed exactly in his father's footsteps. He's a fake reformer, as King Hussein was. There have been no real reforms in Jordan. Um, the quantum of power that civilians have, as opposed to the palace, has not risen under King Abdullah, who's in power now about 10 years. Um, every six or nine months, he fires the prime minister and chooses a new one, almost always from the same small coterie of families around the, around the royal family. Um, so when people get annoyed, well, nothing's happening. Nothing's changed. Good. Got a new prime minister. Um, he's been doing it for 10 years. I don't know that he can do it for 20 years. The problem, of course, of reform is if you were to have democracy, the Palestinians would outnumber the East Bankers or Bedouin who are the base of support for the throne. How can the king do that? Not only are they the base of support for the throne in some uh, cephalogical sense, they're the police and the army. So they're the guys with guns. And if you were to say to them, I've decided we're going to have a real democracy and power is going to go to the Palestinians, it's not clear that all the guys with guns would say, yes, sir. Uh, Your Majesty. Um, it's very tough. I'm making light of it, but in fact, you know, if I were his brother, he has brothers, I'm not sure what I would tell him to do. Um, he's been managing with lots of Saudi money and some American money just, you know, to keep everything afloat, uh, kind of waiting for something to happen, um, waiting for a good turn, maybe waiting for a Palestinian state in the West Bank which would change the Jordanian, Jordanian internal situation. But um, I would not say that there's an immediate threat to the throne in the sense that I would be completely shocked if I were to wake up a month from today and find out there's a big rebellion. But over, a, say, a 10-year period, I don't see how he continues the game that he and his father have been playing for all these decades. I think it's getting tougher and tougher, partly as the Palestinian population grows in number and as its economic dominance in the country becomes uh, stronger. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have this evening. Please join me in thanking Elliot Abrams once again for his visit. Thank you.